My name is Sanjay Arya. I lead the innovation team at Morningstar, Morningstar Indexes. Even if you don't follow finance news, you would have surely heard of Sensex, which is basically an index representing the Indian equity market. An index is basically a basket of stocks picked with some science behind it, which represents a view on something. For example, you can follow the small cap index to get a view on how small cap companies are performing in the stock market. This episode of the Founder Thesis podcast is a masterclass in the business of indexes. Your host, Akshay Dad, talks with Sanjay Arya, an Indian-born American who built the index business of Morningstar. Sanjay talks about why indexes are a big business, how they have evolved over the years, and what is on the horizon. Stay tuned and subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app to understand the world of finance and business from a global perspective. You know, I uh, sat down with our CEO at that time, Joe, who was the founder of the company. I had a one-page business plan. I, we had a 20-minute conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he said, yeah, okay, let's do it. And, uh, but be scrappy. And I was obviously excited and elated about the whole thing, but I did not uh, capture what the scrappy means, which would be later on, I understood there's not a lot of money to be invested in the business, but see if you can make something out of it. It was, the, our timing was good. I think it was a fun time to be in the industry where ETFs are beginning to grow and a lot happening. And ETF is an exchange traded fund. Yeah. So ETF is uh, like an open end fund, which actually trades intraday. So you can actually, it's an... Generally, it started off as an index, taking an index basket and building an, an open and mutual fund around that. And so if somebody wanted to kind of trade during the day, you could do that as well. So that's actually... Yeah. So how, uh, the difference between a mutual fund and an ETF is that in a mutual fund, you pay money to the fund manager. And if you want to withdraw money, the fund manager gives it back to you. But in an ETF, that mutual fund can be sold to other people directly. Like you don't have to go through the fund manager. It's listed on an exchange. So you're trading between, uh, there's a transaction happening between two different entities. The other big uh, difference in the US, obviously, is that the tax benefit really, if you own an ETF, you don't really pay taxes on an annual basis. But in the US, you actually have to pay taxes on the mutual fund, on the realized, any unrealized gains as well. So it's, a, it's much more a tax efficient vehicle. So you control your own tax destiny. So when you sell, then you kind of have to pay it. So there's an added benefit to that as well. And all of the ETFs that were in the first generation, they were all index-based, so they were low cost. And ETF can also continue to accept money directly from investors. It's not just people buying and selling on the exchange, but the fund also continues to take money in from investors. And... But the other thing is, it's, since it's listed on an exchange, it's, it's very transparent. So you know exactly all the underlying holdings, what's its holdings. So they are... A few benefits that came along with that and low cost being one of them. So I think that the whole notion of being a more investor friendly structure, it appealed to a lot of people. And today it's about seven, eight trillion dollars in total assets on the management in ETF structure. So that was actually part of our initial motivation. We will build the indexes that will be useful for Morningstar and its entire ecosystem and then be able to find ways to license it for other applications as well. And how does one go about building an index? Like, how did you build your first index? And I'm sure it would have evolved that today the way of building an index would be very different. We, what we used to say was the barriers to entry at that point when we got in were very, very high. And today, the barriers to entry in the business are relatively low because the technology has evolved so much, the data is easily access, accessible. But the barriers to success in the business are still very high. It's an it's industry that is dominated by a handful of very large providers and then there's a long tail of providers who are actually it's a big pie they can have a small fraction of the pie but the big pieces of the pie are still owned by you know, some very large uh, providers but to your question again i think what you really need is access to data that is coming from all the listed companies on an exchange so you need to have capability to gather all the information corporate events which probably through a bloomberg subscription you could get that I guess there are sources you could get through which you can get that. If you want to maintain real-time calculation, I think that's a whole different ballgame because the indexes that have listed the ETFs on it, you do need to have, be able to maintain that on a real-time basis. So you need to capture the data 
as it uh, as the trades are happening, you need to pick up uh, those trades and in the index, uh, the company values. Corporate actions when the company is paying dividends, stock splits, and things of that nature, you need to have a good source to gather all of that as well. Yeah, and then yeah, be able to publish some of those. So those are the main, I would say, thresholds in order to gather that. So today it doesn't seem it's outside the realm of possibility, but but back in the day, you really need to invest in technology and kind of be able to gather information from different exchanges around the world, all the corporate actions that are happening. So those are the main things. And then I guess you try to find what are some of the unique gaps in the industry once an index is done or you have defined what the market makeup is. It's basically the same thing other people would come up later on. Is there value in kind of doing creating more of those indexes? I guess it becomes very commoditized once it's, you, you define market, which is, we call it beta. Once the beta is defined, I guess there's not too many different ways you can actually enhance the value of that. Yeah, like there's no use making a broad index because everyone will use S&P 500. You would rather want to find a niche and make an index in that niche. Yeah. What was Morningstar's journey like in terms of what niches you made indexes for and how did you monetize them? Yeah. So I guess we, we always have the view that I think you want to focus on what you're really good at and or what you're known for. And I think Morningstar, when we, Morningstar is very well known for how we've taken mutual funds and we've created a two-dimensional three by three, uh, what we call the style box. So on, on one, on the horizontal axis, we have value, core and growth. So you look at the other companies, what stage of growth they are in, are they value-based or growth-based? And then on the vertical axis, you know, large, mid and small. So it's, it buckets all the companies in the universe along those two dimensions into one of the nine boxes. And that's how we were looking at all the mutual funds, how the mutual fund managers were managing their portfolio, where their orientation was, and then using the same kind of lens to help people understand what the market, how the market is behaving, it was helpful. If you want to, you can have a big picture overall what the market is doing, but then underneath the market, I guess uh, it behaves very differently in, in large growth versus small, small value. So having been able to provide that nuanced insights into the market where the headwinds and tailwinds are, I think it was helpful. So we took that as a starting point, started off, and it actually resonated quite well because it's a lot of morning stars, users who actually already understood that the lay of the land, I think for them, this was a very helpful tool. Okay. So, so you created nine indexes then, but for each of those boxes in the matrix. Yeah. So there were nine one for each and then I guess I would say that we combine different permutation combinations so there was a 16 total so there's a overall market and then there's a large cap mid cap small and value for and growth so overall there were 19 but the nine components they were the building blocks of the whole market so they were what we would call they were mutually exclusive and exhaustive so exhaustive if you combine them together you get the whole market but they were there was no overlap in any of the securities yeah, what's the difference between a value stock and a growth stock? Value stock is something that's uh, companies that are not very, growing very fast, but they have good value. A lot of the uh, the banking energy sectors, growth is generally kind of companies that are growing very fast, less focus on earnings and a lot of the technology type businesses you would find in the in that market. How did you monetize once you created the index? It was not a we easy journey. We built the products and I guess, and then... It took us about two years to find a partner, which was a big milestone for us. And then they created ETFs around that. There were nine ETF products that were launched and introduced, and that started off our journey. We certainly felt there was a, in our industry, there's a huge inertia. So people do not change or move away from existing products or benchmarks unless they really have to. And there was no kind of compelling reason for them to do that. So we had the early success and along the way, we actually did some other interesting things, but, but the market was still pretty... Complacent again, I don't really need to see a lot of new products there. I'm happy with the branded indexes that are existing out there. And then, and then the global financial crisis happened. And then I think in the US, the market was on 38%. And I think people, it gave them a little bit of a pause that if I'm investing in an index and the index, which people would say that this is an efficient, if you follow the efficient market hypothesis that the market is actually the best gauge and the market knows best. And market knows best and if it's down 38% that there might be other ways for me to contemplate uh, investing. And that was actually, actually for our business, actually, that was actually very beneficial because at the heart of it, research, our DNA is research. So uh, we actually 
thrive in kind of understanding what are some of the factors that are driving manager behavior or equity markets and so forth. And having access to a very large team of equity analysts, I guess we could lean on them to figure out what are some of the factors that are showing persistent in terms of that could add value to an investor's portfolio. I think that gave us an opportunity to bring in, maintain the indexing structure, which we had mastered by that time. We knew exactly being one, one beautiful thing about being late to the market is I think you have to work harder to understand how you can add value and how you can bring value. In the U.S., uh, there, there used to be, there still is actually a car company, Avis Rental Car, and their motto, we are number two, we work harder. And that was our thesis as well. And I think there are index providers who've been there for 50, 100 years before we got there. If you're going to make an impact of some sort, I think we're just going to have to understand and discover what we could do better. And we knew the indexing model quite well. But uh, we wanted to explore how we can actually take that and use that in a different format. And that's where we brought in our equity research and, and post the global financial crisis, the whole notion of what is called strategic beta or smart beta. I think that started people starting getting comfortable with that, that again, I think the market is what it is, but perhaps there are better ways to bring in some active research, transparent indexing structure that is much more investor friendly could be a better way to invest in index funds. So that was a tipping point for our business. We actually launched a product which was taking out the best equity research that we had into an index structure in a very, uh, very focused portfolio. It was like a 20 stock portfolio. And then later on, we expanded that to 40 stocks. And, uh, but the holdings would be transparent, but the weights are very transparent and uh, people could license it to create investment product. And we find partners along the way who actually did that and had tremendous success with that product. Okay. I want to break down some of the stuff that you spoke about. So you said after the financial meltdown of 2007, smart beta or strategic beta came into focus. What does this term mean? Yeah, I guess the traditional beta means that you actually, you invest with the market. So everything that's listed on the market, you're going to take that and proportionally you include every single stock whatever is part of the index in the same way, relative weight. So you're not making any bets there. You're basically saying that whatever the size of the market, the company is relative to the others, that's what your makeup of the index is going to be. It's that simple. Strategic beta is, again, I think if you will, if you think of a spectrum on one side, you have the market and the other side, you have an active manager who's selecting stocks that have very high conviction about. It's somewhere in the middle where you're trying to bring the two pieces together that you still preserve the indexing model where it's a rule-based transparent, you periodically rebalance the portfolios, but you are not betting on the same, all the companies and all the size and everything. You have a way to identify it as there might be a factor that you have conviction about and you are using that to introduce a bias or selection criteria that help you, uh, whatever your objective might be. If you're looking to generate alpha, that would be the one if you're gen looking for more income or mitigate risk, I guess you could actually do with whatever proven research you have access to. Alpha means what an active investor is able to generate over and above the market. That is alpha. As a as an active investor, that's what you aspire to do. You're trying to beat the market and as an active investment manager, I guess that's what you people entrust you to do with their money that you should be able to beat the market. But if not, then why bother? I can actually go with an index fund and kind of save some money there. The, we were very privileged uh, and we still are. We have a like an ecosystem of research, oh, yeah. equity research and ESC research and asset allocation research where we can actually understand how the models, yeah. asset allocation can add value. So we, having unfettered access to some of that research allows us to experiment and kind of look at things a bit differently. And we do have the indexing model, which we know quite well, but then trying to meld some of the other research it is just bringing a different style of indexing that actually, you know, I, I think for the future, this is how it's going to be as we think about the industry is evolving. I'm still not fully clear on what is this new product that you made, which was based on research. You lost a new type of index, which was based on research. What is that? How is it different from the other indexes around? So we have a team of 125 analysts, which was actually smaller at that time. And they do research and they have recommendation on... Like a buy, sell, hold uh, and a target price. Mm -hmm. Right. So they have their first look at the business fundamentals. Is the company, does it have any 
moat in their business. So they have an economic moat rating, wide moat, narrow moat, no moat. It's a term from Warren Buffett. You, know, you want to go for businesses that have a wide moat, then they have something unique advantage that are difficult to replicate, and which means they will have more pricing power and high margins and so forth. Um, and then they, they also look at the, the, they do their own discount cash flow and come up with evaluation models. If the companies are trading below their expectation or, or, uh, or above or whatever. So thinking a combination of companies that have a wide moat, which are businesses that have more entrenched pricing power or, and which are trading at a discount. So we selected, it's a, there's a lot of active research that goes into determining those criteria. But beyond that, I guess we have rules which, say, which have been established that once a quarter, we look at the 20 cheapest white mode businesses. So, so that'll be a basket we actually create the index of. So it's, I would say it's a marriage between kind of active and passive to create something that'll actually, in this case, the index is not giving you beta, it's giving you alpha. And it's actually done quite well. It's not every year it's actually hitting it out of the park. But for the most part, when you look at the long term, it's actually, yeah, when you look at the peer group, uh, uh, in the large core category, it's actually been in the top uh, decile for over the last 10 years or so. So again, I, again, I think it's, a, it's just a necessity is the mother of invention. We had something, but you know, the barriers were very high. And I think what we went back to, what we were really good at is our research. And we tried to bring that into the indexing practice. Mm, interesting. So this is in a way like an unbundling of the actively managed mutual fund, what it used to be. So an actively managed mutual fund would probably be doing something like this, where they would say, okay, let's look at companies which are value picks and have a good vote. And they would manage that money for you and charge 2% or 1%, whatever. So now this has got unbundled where Morningstar is doing this research and creating an index, which is equivalent to what a mutual fund might have been doing. And now, a, a, an index mutual fund can be built on top of that with a very low fees, which overall in benefits the investors. Think about, I guess it's a, like I said, it's a marriage between good active and passive. You bring some of those, the attributes of an index. And the benefits of active and the cost of passive, basically, like for an investor. Yeah. So that's strategic beta, what we call it, Morningstar, people call it the smart beta, enhanced beta, whatever. There are many different terms in the industry, but let's say if you were to do a Venn diagram, it's like the overlapping part in the middle where you have passive and active on either side, but this is where you kind of meet in the middle. Yeah. yeah very interesting. Uh, very innovative in terms of how it's cut down costs for actively managed. Uh, you're getting an actively managed portfolio at one tenth the cost, basically. Uh, it's super interesting. Okay. And so you've now also launched an index for private market. Tell me about that. What is the use case for an index on private market? And what made you want to launch that? I think, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think we see there's been a tremendous shift from public to private. And I think this, this segment of the market, which is really had explosive growth is a late stage private venture cap, venture back businesses. The term unicorn, which is a com private venture back companies with a billion dollar in market valuation. It was coined in 2014 and it was named after a mythical creature, the unicorn, which means it's very rare. And at that time, there's about less than 40 unicorns globally. And I think it was. Yeah, India probably had just one, or I think Inmobi was like probably the only unicorn at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Today, there's about close to about 1300. Unicorns and some of these are deca coins, and some of them like by dance, it's about 300 billion, strike for 100 billion. So th these are not rare anymore and these are not small anymore. So there's a whole segment of the market that's actually pre IPO that is actually huge and this market is growing. And you, you hear anecdotally people saying that this is a market which is actually doing really well, but there's no gauge, there's no market sentiment, there's no understanding of what the market looks like. So having the pitch book, the, the level of data that they have and research they have, like, uh, we are very fortunate to be able to take some of that, uh, even though it's very unstructured data, unlike public markets where each company has a ticker and a QCIP and it's very easy to manage and move things around. We had to jump a lot of hoops in order to normalize this data and kind of create a more structured way of kind of, so we can build some in the index back histories and normalize some of this. But we, we were very excited. I think now we can shine the light on what the market looks like in this space. This is between companies going before they go public and the late stage. And there's, this is where, in our view, convergence of public and private markets beginning to happen. So you see a lot of mutual fund managers, what they call crossover managers, 
they're beginning to own late stage private companies in the mutual fund portfolios. And you have the traditional VCs and you know the general pension plans and the like who are actually investing in that. And this market is going to become much more visible and transparent. And our goal is to, whatever we can do to shine the light and kind of help people understand what are the risks uh, when people say there's more than meets the eye. There, we saw FTX, which was another company that just went bankrupt from 32 billion to zero. Those kind of things. And when you aggregate the whole market, I think it'll give you a full picture in terms of uh, on a daily basis, you know, how the market's behaving, what are the long-term risk and return features of this market. If you want to look at uh, through the lens of different industry verticals, what are the fintech or what are some of the SaaS businesses doing, you'd be able to kind of slice and dice some of that as well. So it's, it's a big new journey. Again, I think we think okay. this the first step is create a market sentiment. And then as the market infrastructure improves, I think there'll probably be ways you can invest in this segment of the market as well. We're not there yet. But any and and they, if there are managers who are actually investing in purely in this segment, this would be a, a reasonable benchmark for them as well. Uh, what is your unicorn index like? How many companies does it consist of, and like how, how did you build it? Help me understand that. Though today there's about like I said, thirteen hundred companies that are part of the unicorn, and we have a broad global index which actually includes all of those. I would say that's akin to a like a beta product in this space. And then we have a reach, then we have 11 or 10 other regional indexes. So there's a US, UK, China, and India. You include all the whole universe of US unicorns is included and same for India and so on. So there's a broad product for US, which has about six and the 50 or so, which has, which is virtually every unicorn out there. And then we have a US 100, which is a scaled down version of the parent index. It's This is indexing science here, but with 100 securities, we can actually replicate the almost 99.9. The correlation is very high. So you don't really need to have all the every single company that being part of that. Uh, same thing, we have uh, the UK index and then China and India. In India, we have uh, India 25. The total number of uh, unicorns in India is uh, somewhere between 70 and 100. Like, the number is uh, disputable, but whatever. Uh, the 25 actually will give you a very healthy kind of mix of what the market looks like and you know what it tracks the broad index quite well. So it's, uh, again, I think the other thing we've done is we built a pricing model that goes beyond with unicorns or any private company for that matter. You, a value is ascribed only when a new deal happens. It's like real estate. When that transaction happens, typically it's like once every 18 months or so on average. But what happens in those 18 months, like especially in the last 18 months, a lot can change. And our goal is to be able to present uh, what is a more indicative value of the market in that time period as well. So we've uh, looked at the other places where there's some price discovery on the private market side, looking at companies that are similar to the business we are looking at. So Pitchhook has analysts who actually can help us look at what are some of the cohorts, similar companies. And if there's a funding round that is happening in those, that actually provides you an indication of where the market's heading. Likewise, on the public market side as well, there are industries within which the index, the company sits. So we can use that as an indication of how the uh, the price li is likely to be plenty of research out there that shows there's a nine to 12 month lag between public markets and private markets. So we are able to bundle all of those three factors together. And on a daily basis, we are able to get a single value for each company and provide the, a market view, which is more realistic view of, as opposed to looking at the last few values. Okay. So for example, Amazon is a publicly traded company and price movement of Amazon would affect Flipkart's valuation in India, which you would factor in to create a real-time daily update of Flipkart's valuation. In addition to, let's say, other transactions happening in the e-commerce space, so all of those would factor into a daily revision of Flipkart's estimated value. That's right. Swiggy is a big Indian food delivery company, and you have comparables, DoorDash and others who've gone public. Hmm. Zomato is listed in India also, yeah. So you can actually look at their fluctuation, their market value, because in the within the industry cohort, there's a lot of systematic risks that you can actually, which are very similar to the businesses. Similarly, Paytm's price would influence all fintech companies' pricing valuation in the index. Like you told me, the first time you built an index, it took you two years to monetize. So right now you are in that two-year phase, basically, of this index, because... Monetization right now is tough because there is no exchange for buying and selling 
stocks of startups which are not listed, but you feel that eventually some liquidity would come in here, like you would be able to buy and sell stocks of unlisted startups? Yeah, you'll be surprised. I think where there's a will, there's a way. I think we actually, even in the short period we've since we've announced the introduction of our indexes, we've actually had people from different parts of the world who reach out and said that we've been thinking about this or we've actually built our own index, which is on a spreadsheet, but it gives us something that we can actually hang our hat on and use it. And they've got some ideas in terms of synthetically or other ways they would actually start looking at it. And uh, the, the arc of innovation will certainly solve some of these problems today. It's not it's not easy to fully replicate it, and I don't think we will ever get there. But uh, the main thing is exposure, and there's, uh, there's a lot of wealthy investors who are looking to gain exposure to this segment of the market. The, there are funds out there, but I think when you look at the fee structure, it's very uh, the traditional institutional 2 and 20, which are very high. So if, oh. I'm sure there's folks who will actually figure out like how to uh, do it in a more cost-efficient manner, and, and our goal is we've got the infrastructure and we, we can create more bespoke products. If somebody has a need, we don't have to have a hundred stock portfolio. We can actually make it smaller based on what is more tradable or what is more accessible to from, from the market. So again, I think it's going to be a little bit um, collaborative in terms of working with the prospective asset manager in terms of what their needs are and how we kind of solve these problems. Um, interesting. So there are two use cases for this currently. One would be like, say, a Sequoia would use this to as a benchmark that uh, are they doing better than the unicorn index because Sequoia is essentially private equity investor. And the second is to build synthetic products. Now, help our listeners understand what's a synthetic product which could be built on top of the unicorn index. You know, I think we've got a history in terms of what the risk return pattern of this index looks like. Uh, plenty of uh, these global banks who actually know how to synthetically replicate when you give them a risk return profile, they can use derivatives to create, replicate that. Uh, and uh, with the swap product, I guess there could be somebody on the long side and somebody on the short side, then long side people who are looking to invest and gain exposure for the long term. And on the short side, somebody who already has exposure and they're trying to mitigate the risk. So they would sit in the middle okay. and be able to use you know, some kind of a derivative instrument to to predict what the uh, the pattern of uh, return going forward would be. What is your view on the future of the indexing industry? So obviously, I think we the industry has grown so much. And today, I think I might, might have mentioned this earlier, the beta has become commoditized. So there's no, it's a race to the bottom in terms of how you access it. And we've already seen that. And again, gradually, I think all of that we see with the big providers in the US, be it the BlackRock, ISHIS and Vanguard and State Street. You know, it's basically... It's an access point. It's not something unique that anybody can offer. So the cost is obviously going to be a big determinant in, in terms of how this is delivered. See, I guess the future innovations are going to be in some areas like, you know, ESC. Again, I think how people are trying to align their portfolios to their value systems and belief systems. And they believe in climate is going to have an impact on how they express their convictions in that way. And then the third thing I would say is I think in the whole notion of personalization direct indexing is another area which has really caught on so direct indexing is you take a starting point as an indexing basket and then you can actually eliminate some stocks based on let's say if you work for a technology company or in that sector and you don't want any more exposure you can actually underweight that segment it just gives you a lot more ability to personalize it and with the technology today it's it's Almost all the major asset managers, wealth managers are now beginning to offer you that personalization. So it's not, you don't have to buy an index fund, but you can have an index which is tailored to your personal needs. And it could be, you can also implement your personal ESC. So you don't have to buy an ESC fund, which might be very generic in terms of it's one size fits all. But if you really care about tobacco not being part of it or guns not being part of it, you can actually eliminate some of that exposure as well. 